we can't really talk about ALS without paying our uh, respect to Jean-Martin Charcot. I think his genius lies in the fact that he uh, linked 50 years of slow scientific development and ended up characterizing ALS as a distinct entity. And he described the natural history of the disease back then that remains true to this day. I mean, that is actually what's amazing about him. And ALS is not picky. It affects anybody, right? In the US, it's called Lou Gehrig's disease based on the uh, New York Yankee baseball player Lou Gehrig's who, had, who died of ALS in his late 30s. But perhaps the most um, famous person with ALS is Stephen Hawkins. Uh, disease started at the age of 21, lived 55 years, just died last year. One of the most amazing brains of um, our generation. And really, his uh, life with ALS was depicted in this movie. And I want you to um, watch a short clip uh, just to put things into per perspective. And I hope that the sound will, will be high enough. It's called motor neuron disease. It's a progressive neurological disorder that destroys the cells in the brain that control the central muscle activity, such as speaking, walking, breathing, swallowing. The signals that muscles must receive in order to move are disrupted. The result is gradual muscle decay, wasting away. Eventually, the ability to control voluntary movement is lost entirely. I'm afraid average life expectancy is two years. There's nothing I can do for you. What about the brain? The brain isn't affected. Your thoughts won't change. It's just that well, eventually no one will know what they are. I'm ever so sorry. This is a good lesson in humility. He was so wrong on all. Uh, on everything he just said. So we think of ALS as a really rare disease, but it's not that rare. It has the same incidence as multiple sclerosis. However, because it's a, um, I mean, it's a deadly disease, the prevalence is low. It is the most common motor neuron disease, and it's the third most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. It is a male predominant disease, and the age of onset usually is the fifth decade. It's, it's uh, 10 years younger in the uh, familial patient. Dr. Kalb talked about this, but I put it back on to really reiterate that the pathological hallmark of this disease is the degeneration of the motor neurons in the brain, um, in the cortex. And these are called upper motor neurons. That is important because I'm going to talk about the exam later. The upper motor neuron sign is the lower motor neuron signs. So this upper motor neuron in the cortex degenerates, but in the same time, the, the lower motor neuron in the brainstem nuclei or in the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord degenerates too. Sometimes only one type of neuron degenerates, one the upper versus the lower, and we have different presentation of the disease, and I'll talk to you about that. And as you can see, these neurons could degenerate at any level of the uh, nervous system. So unfortunately, the diagnosis of ALS is quite simple, actually. It's just a clinical diagnosis. Um, there is nothing you could do that will help you diagnose it except your really clinical skills, sitting down with the patient, taking a good history, and doing a very thorough exam. And at the end, you should have the diagnosis. It's unfortunate because any test that you can run will only help you rule out something that looks like ALS. There is nothing you can do to actually prove that somebody has ALS. There is no lab test, there is no um, EMG, there is no um, MRI, it's just your clinical skills. People are working on that, and some kind of neurofilament and things are developing to help us with the diagnosis, but it's not available yet. Uh, we do have research criteria that we use that are called the LS Coriel criteria. The World Federation of Neurology met in um, 
2000 in Alas Corial in Spain and came up with this criteria to make sure that when we enroll patients in clinical trial, we are talking the same. Um, I mean, we, we know that they are either a definite form of ALS or a probable form of ALS, and we all understand what that means to make sure we have a very homogeneous sample. And we do have our red flags. Usually, and again, patients don't read textbook, and there, there is always exception to the rules, but usually patients with ALS will not have sensory involvement. They will not have autonomic dysfunction, no movement disorder, no ocular symptoms. Cognitive, initially we thought, we thought there was no cognitive, cognitive involvement, but we do know that there is cognitive involvement that is different from what you see in, AI, in Alzheimer's, for example. This is a frontotemporal dementia kind of dysfunction, which, which I will talk to you about later. And with all this, and if you remember what I showed you about the upper motor neuron, the lower motor neuron, and where the disease starts, it's very uh, heterogeneous disease. Because if you only have the upper motor neuron, you have what we call a PLS, or a primary lateral sclerosis. If you only have the lower motor neuron, you have a progressive muscular atrophy. Why is it important? These things, they behave differently from ALS. They have a different prognosis. Whereas the typical ALS, people live about three, five, six, seven, eight years, who knows now how long. Uh, PMA and PLS usually have a, a longer progression of symptoms. You have patients who start very early, like Stephen Hawking, 21 years. We call it juvenile or young onset. When we have people that start with the disease in their 80, what is it about them? Why is it different? Um, it can start in the bulbar area. It can start in the spinal area with an arm or a leg onset. So all these shows us that when we deal with ALS, it's very, very heterogeneous. And there is multiple facets of this disease. So how does it present? How does this disease present? I really wanted to take you over a few vignettes that will describe the clinical presentation of this disease. These are really true stories. These are patients I've seen in clinic just last week. Um, so let's start with the first one. This is a 48-year-old that I first saw a few years back, November of 2016. And I really want you to pay attention to the timeline. So this is what she says, that in winter of 15, she noticed that she had some uh, balance loss, and she was having a few falls. This is an avid runner, so she's used to having some aches and pains, and uh, she didn't think anything of it. Um, in the summer of 15, the number of falls have increased, and now she's tripping on her right foot when walking, and she drags it along. Notice how insidious things are, right? And she still didn't think of it. She thought, maybe I have a tight etty band. She went to PT and uh, hoping to get better. Few months later, she noticed that the weakness of her leg is now a little bit worse. She's having cramps and twitching, and finally went to see somebody when the twitching were more spread. And now, when I saw her, she had a really harder time walking. She couldn't run anymore. Um, so this is one presentation. We call it a spinal presentation because this patient started with a leg dysfunction. How about this patient? Um, it just happens that it's female. I mean, it's, it is more prominent in male, but uh, the two examples are female. And um, this form is actually more frequent in female. This patient presented with difficulty with her speech and swallowing. So this one, in July of 18, she noticed that after a glass of wine, she will slur her speech. And she noticed it will start more in the evening or when she's stressed out. But then, it wasn't happening just sporadically. It seemed to happen more often and even without wine, and even at different times of the day, not just in the, in the evening. And then it started to be consistent all the time, not just sporadically. So finally, she decided to see her primary care physician, who did a CT scan of her brain, find it to be normal, sent her to see the neurologist. The neurologist did an MRI, the MRI being normal. He did a swallow study because she had difficulty with swallowing and had lost weight. He sent her to see a speech pathologist, and she did speech therapy, of course, without improvement in her symptoms. This is a bulbar onset disease. It's more frequent in females. And this is usually how people present. And now we have uh, this gentleman, 58-year-old, who was traveling and noticed when he went in the airplane and was trying to reach in the overhead compartment to put his bag. He was not able to do that. He, it was harder for him to do. And then this other gentleman who came to see me because he had a year history of left-hand weakness. He was having difficulty buttoning his shirts, um, turning the key when he drive the car, or clipping his fingernails. 
So this is an arm onset disease. It could be either proximal, like the gentleman who's trying to put things in the overhead compartment, or it could be distal, um, affecting the um, fine motor skills. And if you had paid attention, you could hear that none of these patients complained of any pain, and they did not have any sensory symptoms. So what do we find when we examine these patients? When, after we take this history and we kind of uh, have an idea about where this is going, the exam really focused on finding the element of lower motor neuron involvement and upper motor neuron involvement. Because what we want to see as a hallmark of ALS is the presence of the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron in the same segment. So what are the signs of lower motor neuron? Weakness, when we do our MRC, our strength exam, when we use the MRC scale, we, we notice weakness that is usually focally, that starts in focally and then spreads. We, we see the atrophy, as you can see here, the wasting of the muscles. And we also see the fasciculation. Usually patients do not complain of fasciculation. We're the one to point them out. And sometimes as you're examining the patient, you may actually elicit a cramp. So these are elements of lower motor neuron. How about the upper motor neuron? So when the upper motor neuron is degenerating, it causes specific finding on exam. Of course, we have the weakness, but it's more of a loss of coordination than a true weakness. And we have increased tone or spasticity. We see clonus. We see brisk reflexes, new reflexes that are not supposed to be there, like a Hoffman sign, for example. Babinski sign is interesting. We don't see Babinski often in patients with ALS. We think of Babinski more when there is a structural lesion. But patients with ALS could have very brisk reflexes, but will not have an upgoing toe. So if it's there, it's OK. But if it's absent, it doesn't rule out upper motor neuron involvement. And at the bulbar level, lower motor neuron also and upper motor neuron could be difficult to see. Of course, we have the difficulty with speech, the dysarthria, the difficulty swallowing, the dysphagia. Um, they have decreased elevation of their palate. The tongue is weak, usually on both sides. Fasciculation of the tongue are difficult to see, and you want to have the tongue relaxed. And many times, when patients try to protrude their tongue, you see fibrillation at the surface. You just have them to put, you have to ask them to put the tongue back and try to relax it. And that's when you can see the fasciculation. They're easier to see on a tongue that is already atrophied. On a full tongue, it's not that easy. An upper motor neuron dysfunction at the barbar level is also different, I mean, from what you expect to see in the, I mean, we're not going to see spasticity, but we can see spasticity in the speech. The speech will be, it has a strangled, strangled quality to it. It will be um, nasal because of the palatal weakness. The patient will have a hyperactive gag, and if we tap on their jaw, they will have a brisk jerk and sometimes even a clonus of the jaw and uh, they will have other reflexes like, like a snout. I just want you to listen to um, the speech of an ALS patient with some upper motor neuron dysfunction here, and you can hear the slowness of the speech. And I have two different um, stages of the disease, one that we can understand and one that we can no longer really understand that well. I was a construction worker. My balance and stuff started really messing up. I was tripping and falling, not knowing why or what's really wrong with me. My name is Daryl Carradine. I was diagnosed with ALS in March of 2015. You can notice how kind of difficult and slow the speech is. And let's listen to this. The first thing was I had spending my life thrown in the lockout. I was 37. And you can hear the hypernasality here and how difficult it is actually to um, understand. Oops, I was sorry, a construction worker. So, yes, all we need is our uh, reflex hammer, our clinical, I mean, you, at the end of the encounter, we should have a very good idea of what's going on. We should have a high suspicion of the disease, and we're going to use what we have to try to confirm that diagnosis as much as we can or to rule out other things. So how do we approach the differential diagnosis of ALS? It's kind of vast, right, and very heterogeneous. 
So the way to think about it is to look at the patient and see what's the predominant sign. And usually patient will be either upper motor neuron predominant or lower motor neuron predominant. And if they are, for example, lower motor neuron predominant, I think the most important thing to rule out is treatable cause. And the most important treatable cause are the multifocal motor neuropathy or the uh, motor predominant CIDP. Those are inflammatory disorder of the uh, peripheral nerve, and they're treated with uh, immunomodulatory treatment. So we do not want to miss those. How do we diagnose those? The, this is where the EMG, or the first part of the EMG called the nerve conduction study, will help us. Um, in multifocal motor neuropathy, we see the myelination and conduction block, and so in CIDP2. Multifocal motor neuropathy starts focally and kind of spreads, so maybe the most important mimicker of, of ALS, whereas motor predominant CIDP is usually more of a, a diffuse kind of disease and symmetric, which usually ALS is not symmetric. The other uh, mimicker, especially in patients with bowel bar dysfunction, and male specifically with bowel bar dysfunction, is Kennedy's disease. And this is a genetic disease um, that presents with a slowly progressive dysphagia, dysarthria, and proximal weakness. And it's easy to make the difference. With a blood test, we have the genetic diagnosis. Um, and it, it's usually slower progression than your typical ALS. The other mimicker of the lower motor neuron predominant disease, uh, ALS is inclusion body myositis. This is a muscle disease, and this is where a muscle biopsy will help us um, make the difference. This is also very slowly progressive. Usually, patient will come to us after three, four, sometimes even five years of symptoms, which you know when you hear that, that this is unlikely to be ALS. Now, if the predominant symptom is an upper motor neuron dysfunction, the most important one is the primary progressive MS, and that's where an MRI of your C-spine, thoracic spine, will help make the difference. Um, hereditary spastic paraparesis is rare disease, but sometimes could uh, be a mimicker of primary lateral sclerosis, and it's something that uh, we should be able to rule out. There, too, genetic testing will help us, and usually the, the spasticity is bilateral uh, and symmetric, and, it, and it's slowly progressive. But the most common mimicker of ALS, the one that presents with both upper and lower motor neuron findings sometimes, is the cervical myelopathy. So patients with cervical disease, very, very common. They could have weakness at the level of the lesion. They could have arm weakness, for example, and they can have spasticity beyond that of the legs. So that's why a cervical spine MRI is very, very important to get uh, when we're thinking of, um, of this. There is also a few findings when we examine patients with ALS that makes us think more of ALS than other things. So fasciculation, a lot of patients come to us complaining of fasciculation. It's funny because patients who have benign fasciculation tend to be the ones to be aware of them more than the patients who actually have true fasciculation. But you know, if you see diffuse fasciculation everywhere, that's unlikely to be benign. Um, usually patients who come in and complain of benign fasciculation, this fasciculation are really hard to see when we examine them. Um, Bilateral wasting of the tongue, if the tongue is atrophied on both sides, that's more likely to be um, ALS than anything else. And there is this, th this thing called split hand syndrome. Split hand is the characteristic atrophy of these part of the hand, the thenar eminence compared to the hypothenar eminence. So for example, if you have an ulnar neuropathy, you expect this part of the hand to atrophy, but this part too. And if you have median neuropathy, you have only this to be atrophied. But in ALS, because of the cortical representation of the pincer grasp, these uh, muscles here will atrophy at the same time, and we get a split hand syndrome, and that is almost pathognomonic of ALS when we see it. The other thing is this increased, I forgot to tell you earlier when I talked about the bar uh, symptoms, is the emotionality, is the pseudobarbar affect, which is a sign of upper motor neuron. These are patients who start crying or laughing for no reason, and um, it's very, uh, I mean, socially sometimes um, makes them feel inadequate, uh, but this increased, uh, this pseudobarbar affect is also, you don't see it in other things usually. Um, I mean, you could see it in very progressive MS, but you'll have other things with that. And of course, the, pro the cognitive dysfunction, especially of the frontotemporal type, there is uh, an overlap between frontotemporal dementia and ALS, and some patients may have frontotemporal dementia only, some patients will have ALS only, but there is a subgroup of patients will have both. So if you see cognitive dysfunction of the frontotemporal type, that kind of makes you think of ALS um, more. 
So after I gave you the differential diagnosis and told you what are the things that make me more suspicious, what are the most important tests that we order as we see somebody with ALS? Of course, I mean, lab tests, CKs are important. Patient with uh, active de denervating, re disease like ALS will have high CK. So it's not unusual to see CK in 500, 600. That doesn't make us worry. But CK over 1,000 is uh, something to be worried about. And usually when a patient has a CK over 1,000, we'll get a muscle biopsy. Uh, spinal tap, and we usually do it in younger patients. It helps us rule out inflammatory disorder of the peripheral nerve, or uh, we can look for oligoclonal band if we're thinking about primary progressive MS. Nerve conduction study and EMG, I'll show you an example in a second. And of course, we do MRI brain. We look at the C-spine, thoracic spine, and sometimes the lumbar spine uh, when patients have like an onset in the limb. And we talked about muscle biopsy when uh, we think that there is an element of inclusion body myositis or elevated CK. Just to give you an idea what goes in our mind when we see a, a patient, what are the things that we order to make sure we confirm the diagnosis. So what do we expect from the nerve conduction study? And uh, this is actually a patient with uh, ALS, a true patient with ALS. And technically, I just realized that our temperature are not great, so don't look at that. Uh, <laughs> Didn't pay attention to that initially. So when, when you lose muscle fibers and we put our electrode on the muscle uh, actually to record, you expect the amplitude to go down. And that's what we see here, the amplitude of the motor responses are down. And, um, but you expect these latencies to be normal and you expect the conduction velocity to be normal. However, if you lose your fast conducting axon, you may get a little bit of slowing down of these uh, latency and uh, conduction velocities. But they shouldn't be in what we call the demyelinating range, okay? And this sometimes may confuse some electromyographer and have them worry that maybe there is an element of demyelination when it's not there, really. And besides, our temperature here are a little bit cold, so that could be contributing to this borderline um, uh, latencies. And remember, I told you this is a really a motor predominant disease. You, our sensory responses should be normal. And we can see here nice, really nice, robust sensory responses. So you see decreased motor amplitude, but then the sensory will be normal. And when we do the needle part of the exam, this test is important because it does help us confirm the diagnosis. It will show us the diffuse change. The patient may have weakness in one arm, but then when we do the EMG, it's everywhere. And that's the thing that kind of makes us think that this is most likely to be ALS. And we do have criteria that help um, go from like possible, probable, and definite, depending on the spread of these EMG changes. Usually when we do the MRI, it's normal, and that's why sometimes, I mean, PCPs in the community say, oh, well, the MRI is normal. I don't know why you're having those kind of things. But sometimes the MRI will show us if there is increased, if there is an upper motor neuron predominant syndrome, we could see the corticospinal tracts, and there is some increased signal there. However, to really see the corticospinal tract, you have to have um, diffusion tensor imaging, and you can even measure the thickness of the cortex, and you see decrease in the thickness in patients who will have some cognitive dysfunction later on. The spinal cord is important to look at, the spe specifically the cervical spinal, uh, the, the, the cervical spinal MRI when we talk about cervical myelopathy. But there is research that is actually looking at the diameter of the cord and trying to map the corticospinal tract and follow them longitudinally to see if we can see the, the progression of the disease. So I talked to you about uh, sporadic ALS. And uh, Dr. Cobb did talk a little bit about familial ALS. I want you to know that only 10% of the patient will have a familial, uh, it will have a positive family history or have a positive gene for ALS. And the clue comes either from a positive history or sometimes patients don't have a family history if we see an early onset disease. So when patients start at least 10 years younger, that kind of makes us think that uh, this could be a familial and we send for genetic testing. And of course, I won't bore you with this. Dr. Cobb went over it. There is really an explosion in the past decade of gene. Now the most important gene is C9 or F72. And it's this one that gives us 
the overlap between frontotemporal dementia and ALS. When you have family with certain patients with ALS, certain patients with FTD, and certain patients with actually both. Um, and you could see this gene also in other neurodegenerative diseases. It's a hexanucleotide repeat, like Huntington disease. Um, and I mean, there is a lot of research. This kind of turned the field over completely. And I would not repeat this, but the importance of the genetic of ALS is really to teach us on the pathway that could be wrong and, that, and help us target treatment and really model the disease. But at the end of the day, we don't have, as Dr. Cobb said, any perfect model. And so it's easy to understand the cause of familial ALS, but what causes sporadic ALS? And we think that it's probably a combination of bad genes and bad environment. We do know that there are genes that increase the susceptibility to ALS. The most important one is ataxin 2. And actually, with ASO, they're thinking about turning off ataxin 2 as a treatment for sporadic ALS. There is a lot of environmental factor out there that we think may contribute to the disease, but the most important ones are the male sex and smoking. All the rest have not, I mean, the, the data on these is um, not very convincing. One of the most important things that the patient want us to talk to about when we see them is, okay, where am I going from here? How would my disease progress? What are our prognostic factors? We do know that the disease lasts between three, five. We know it lasts longer now. Um, but why will it make one patient progress faster compared to another patient? So there is this initiative. The European looked at their, uh, they pulled the data from uh, 14 ALS center. Um, they had 11,000 patients with progression over 20 years. And they came up with a prediction model. And actually, they said when they plugged Stephen Hawking's clinical data in their model, they were able to predict that he had 94% chance to live more than 10 years. So they did predict with this model that his progression is going to be slow. But what are the most important uh, prognostic factors? Age of onset, remember, he, uh, Stephen Hawkins, was 21 year old. So young age of onset is very important. We do know that patients who start young progress slower. The diagnostic delay, if you remember the clinical vignette, some patient had a more protracted time before they saw us. One of the patients had almost two years of symptom before she came to see us. And that diagnostic delay is very important. Usually, patient, it takes a year for a patient from onset of symptom to come to a multidisciplinary clinic is about a year. So if they get to us in less than, than a year, we know it's going to be a very rapid progressive disease. If it's more than a year, we know that it's going to be a little bit slower. And of course, their progression rate. As we get to know them, we, uh, we have functional scales that we use. Um, and depending on how much they progressed in a very short period of time, help us sometimes predict. It's not a linear model, but it helps us predict the progression down the line. Um, their forced vital capacity or their breathing, you're going to learn here today about the importance of monitoring breathing. And the number of FVC at the onset at the first visit will give us an idea about the prognosis. Usually also, bar onset patients have a more fa and a faster progression of their disease. And if they come to us with already a diagnosis of definite ALS, with spread upper and lower motor neuron everywhere, very abnormal EMG, that also is a negative prognostic um, sign. And of course, if they have frontotemporal dementia, it makes the taking care of them very difficult. And if they have the C9 ORF72 patient who have C9 have a faster progression of the of disease. So these are the things that sometimes we use to help patients uh, understand if their disease is going to be a little bit slower or faster. But again, these are not perfect. It's very hard when you sit down with a patient to exactly tell them where they're going to be six months from now or 12 months from now. But the patient initially, when they see us, um, they are really interested. I'm going to change gear now and talk to you a little bit about what do we do with our patient. Um, and we see them in our multidisciplinary clinic. We know that the multidisciplinary care of ALS patient has changed the survival of patient with uh, ALS. It does improve their quality of care. It is endorsed by the AN. And I cannot imagine taking care of ALS patient in a different environment. And you're going to hear today from everybody that plays a role um, in making sure that all the symptoms of this disease are addressed. Actually, we can treat any symptom that the patient can come up with. Um, but unfortunately, when they sit with us that first encounter and they have very little functional decline, they want to know what can we do for them to 
extend their life? What are the disease modifying treatment that we have? And in our arsenal, we don't have many things. We have Rolluzol. It's been around for more than 20 years. Um, and we have a new kid on the block, Derevon, who's been around also for now two or three years. It was approved by the FDA in May of 17. And, and when we do clinical trial, I mean, the, excited, the excitement about these drugs comes from the fact that when we do clinical trial in ALS, we never see this. We never see the separation of curves between the placebo arm and the treatment arm. And we will take anything, even as small as this. So when the study was done with Ruluzol back in the mid-90, it did show a difference, which is really miraculous because all the clinical trials usually fail. It did prolong the survival of patient by three months back then. And when I and, and usually patients come to me and say, what do I do with three months? I mean, I, why would I take a treatment that's going to only extend my life by three months? What I tell the patient is that is true then when we did not really know how to do clinical trial, and we put people from different, very heterogeneous patients together, and that's the survival. We had fast progressors, slow progressors. That's, that's what we got. And any, any positive signal is a good signal. We know now that uh, Rolluzol does slow the progression probably for about a year or even a little bit longer than that. It's small, but it has an effect on the disease. The story of Aderavon is actually an interesting story. It's a trial that was done in Japan. And initially, Aderavon was uh, a drug used for stroke. In Japan, patients who had a stroke would get an IV infusion of Aderavon for two weeks. Um, the first trial in ALS was negative, but when they looked back at, the, at, the, at their data, they saw that the patient who had definite disease did have a response. So they went back and did another trial where they used the, the, um, the inclusion and exclusion criteria in that cohort of patients. They mimicked that cohort of patients, and they did the trial based on that. And they really tried to enroll patients who were going to progress, because if you have a a slow progressing patient in your cohort is going to make, it's going to kind of not show you really an effect because these patients are not going to change. So they ran the trial again over six months and they were able to see again the separation of the curve. They showed that the patient on drug had a 33% slowdown in their functional scale that we use, that we call ALS FRS um, scale. And based on that, they received FDA approval. Um, the way we do this drug, it's an infusion drug, and it's done in, um, in cycles. So the first cycle, they get, 14, uh, they get 14 days of the drug, 14 days off, and the next cycle after that, they, they get 10 days of the drug because the way they did it in Japan, it was like five days on, two days off, like Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday. And so they get five days on and uh, and two, two weeks off, and there it goes, the cycle goes like that. Patient usually play support, and they receive their treatment either at home or in infusion center. The idea is this drug helps um, the oxidative state, I mean, decrease the, um, the, the oxidation of the cell, and, but we really don't know how it uh, really works. The company is trying to come up with an oral form of this drug that's gonna be um, tried in a clinical trial soon. So why is it that we have negative trial? Why is it that in the past decade, 23 trial at least were done and they were all negative? And if you remember that doing clinical trial in ALS and any neurodegenerative disease is really not easy. But ALS in particular, being a heterogeneous, heterogeneous disease, doesn't make it easy. You know, you have people with bow bar, people with um, spinal onset, fast patient, slow patient, you have to really um, it, it's hard to make sure you have a very homogeneous sample. And of course, I think uh, Dr. Cobb went over this. We, weren't, we don't know what we were after, right? We don't know what's broken so we can fix it. That's the main thing. And, and as you saw also, patients don't come to us as soon as they have a weakness. It takes a year, and a year you lost a lot of motor neuron that you may not recover. I think we came along uh, in our trial design, and I'll talk to you about a new innovative way of doing trial design. And of course, it's unfortunate we don't have biomarker. Um, despite all this time, uh, quarter century doing trials, we don't have a really good biomarker for this disease. So we have to do long trials and follow patients for a long time. And we don't know that the drug went to the motor neuron and did what it's supposed to do. And of course, we don't have good preclinical, um, uh, um, what do you call them? <laughs> 
trying to think. I mean, the mouse is not really the human. The model that we have are not good. Sorry, I forgot my word. So we're starting a new initiative, and we're doing a different, using a different way of doing phase two clinical trial in ALS, and we're trying to learn a little bit more about the disease when we do that. These are called the platform trials. This is um, an effort that is pair-headed by uh, MGH, and there is 54 centers in the U.S. participating in this. Um, it's interesting to see there is a big interest in ALS. Um, it's really the neuromuscular disease with the largest drug development pipeline, so there is urgency in making, in coming up with the phase two trial that are fast, that will get drug to phase three, and hopefully to therapies. If you remember the usual way to do clinical trial, we usually build a stadium, and we build an infrastructure, we go through budgeting, contracts with the sponsor, we submit for IRB, and these process takes at least six months to a year. And then when this trial is done, we tear everything uh, down, and then we start all over with another trial. And this process is really inefficient. So the, what the platform trial is trying to do is build one huge infrastructure, infrastructure called the master protocol, and um, test multiple drugs at the same time, and make that infrastructure go forever. So you'll have one event where you go through budgeting, contract, IRB, you have a central IRB, and then you have multiple drugs, and these drugs, you, you, um, you'll try them as amendment to the protocol that you have. And you could drop down drugs that don't look that they're gonna be good, or you can keep drugs that uh, look that they're gonna be um, more efficient, more kind of positive. And if you look at what it takes to do these kind of trial, it's um, really, I mean, very efficient way. So if you, if you had to, to to really test a treatment. It's gonna take you a lot of patient. You have, you need a big sample size and a long time to run the traditional trial. Whereas with the platform, you really gain on the, the patients, the placebo, which is important for the patient to know that you don't need as much placebo and you can do it faster. So again, it's, um, we think of it as multiple trial, but it's actually one huge trial. And it's going to be done the same way. All patients will be in for 24 weeks, six months, and they will have the option to be an open label extension, which really makes patients hopeful, and they like to be in trial when they can get the active uh, drug down the line. These protocols will use the same inclusion and exclusion criteria, except sometimes for different compounds, you may need very specific things, if there is allergy or something, or safety concern. But there'll be um, very large... And um, as you can see here, these trials are going to be open to more kind of patient with a, even breathing that is as low as 50%, because usually traditional trial will want patient to be in the 70%. And the end point, we're going to be the same throughout all these trials. And at the same time, we're going to try and learn about this disease. Um, Dr. Cobb said there is the data approach, and that's what we're going to do. We're trying in a very kind of uniform way, collect information about the disease and about the, uh, and try to find biomarker for this disease. The other important thing is you're going to end up having to share placebo, uh, like this, for example. When patients enter the trial, they have a change, chance of being one to three to placebo, and then you can pull all the placebos. So the patient are really like that because they don't like having to go through a clinical trial and um, may, may and be in a placebo arm. And after six months, whoever is in the placebo could be randomized and join any other regimen after that um, when one trial kind of finish. So, um, and this model is not new. I mean, it's been tried in breast cancer and it's being used actually in uh, Alzheimer's and muscular dystrophy. So that's, we're trying to learn from other platform trial as well. So this is exciting. This is supposed to start. There was a press release two days ago. Uh, they selected the five drug, the five drugs that are going to be tried. Three of them are going to start, and then two will be added. And we're hoping to get started like next year, January of 2020. So this is an exciting uh, thing about doing clinical trial in a different way in, in ALS. And finally, Dr. Um, Cobb talked about this. I wanted to reiterate that we do have mechanis mechanistic approach to this drug. Um, patient with specific familial form, um, really there is hope that this will change their disease. We have the antisensory conucleotide. Actually, the phase three, uh, the SOD, the anti-SOD is a phase three trial, and the C9 is still an early phase uh, trial. 
and there is a gene therapy approach too, targeting these uh, genetic defects. And that's it. <laughs>